to start. Welcome to another dev call. Uh, we had a dev call about the uh, BISC HTTP API, uh, I think a week ago, something like this. And well, it exceeded its one hour and 30 minute uh, time uh, back then, and we decided to do a follow up call. And this is not a follow up call. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I'd like to just uh, go briefly over the results we had uh, last week um, so that we can start uh, doing uh, uh, great stuff and, and going, going forward. Um, and then we, we try to, uh, well, Christoph seems to be joining. Yeah, Christoph is here. Nice. Hi, Christoph. Hi, um, Florian. The story so far, um, we discussed last week, uh, the story has been, uh, the initial uh, uh, motivation has been that uh, an API, an HTTP API, some, some API at least seems like a good idea back then. And there has been some work and some issues with, with I believe, bounties, even bounties attached to them, yes. Um, and well, uh, having an API seems to be a good idea right now. Um, there has been some work done by Mike, by Manfred, by Bernard, uh, starting in 2017, uh, going up to the latest uh, pull requests Bernard made uh, just a couple of months ago, which is still pending, of course. Um, the status quo is there is an API right now. It's in its own repository. Uh, in, in fact, there are maybe more or less two APIs. One is uh, managed by Bernard, one is managed by Mike. Uh, some code from these APIs had already been uh, moved uh, to the core because uh, some business logic has been in the GUI part of BISC. And if you have another API that is not the GUI, you have to move this uh, business logic. And there has uh, some uh, work already been done. Uh, however, there is no clean uh, BISC core API uh, on the Java side that we can uh, that we can use. Um, so, in fact, uh, keeping up the forks of the HTTP, uh, which feature the HTTP API, is quite time-consuming and hard. Um, we uh, identified some um, doubts and issues. Uh, first, being the authentication. Um, the, the, the topic at hand is how can we protect or uh, keep the ethics surface very low so that the uh, release of the API doesn't uh, invite script kiddies and more professionals to attack BISC on a, on a, uh, on a let's say, a easier basis because some code is already there, which they ha had to do uh, by themselves before the API has been released. Um, we talked about the HTTP basic authentication. We talked about um, perfect forward secrecy, so uh, um, uh, replay protection and so uh, stuff like this. Um, then we uh, discussed generally that an API, a web accessible API, poses a bigger ethics surface to, to BISC. Um, well, of course, uh, BISC is getting successful and it's more likely to be a target. So yeah, well, with the API, it, it can be done by a machine and you don't have to click the GUI anymore if you are, uh, if you are not really committed to attacking BISC. Uh, if you are, you of course code your own stuff. Um, denial of service is more feasible uh, because the infrastructure is already provided. Um, yeah, however, the denial of service attacks or attacks in general have to be mitigated on, on BISC level and not on the API level, at least uh, to, a, to a certain degree. And the, a, a big point is that if we, if we uh, actually use, uh, integrate the API, what API uh, ever, if you integrate an API to, to, to BISC, uh, yeah, well, uh, the maintainers have to take responsibility and if something goes wrong, well, uh, BISC maybe die. That's it. Uh, and then the third point in the doubts and issues compartment has been the dependencies. Um, uh, there has been some discussion between, uh, I think, Beth and Wizard, uh, Battle of Wizards and Bernard 
about uh, about uh, the dependencies that have been introduced, and there's been some discussion. Well, uh, if you if you have to do or by yourself or use existing uh, pedal proof, uh, at least pedal tried uh, libraries, and well, last week we we decided that it is not a good idea to get on a big project like an HTTP API without any help of, uh, of existing and uh, existing uh, um, uh, binaries and libraries because HTTP is just too complex to do it by yourself uh, in a in a better way than better, uh, um, proven uh, libraries can do it. Yes. Um, then we had some some uh, discussion about uh, countermeasures, how we can uh, counter the darts and issues just mentioned. Uh, one uh, big point is we have to strengthen the resilience of the BISC network, not on the API level, but the resilience of the BISC network itself. Um, because even now, someone can fork the, the BISC repository and do something evil with it and maybe destroy BISC. Um, then we uh, said, well, if we can manage some separation of concerns, uh, it would be uh, really nice to have to have a, a, the core project, and then we can maybe develop different APIs. One being the GUI, of course, another one maybe being the HTTP API, um, so that we can uh, do this stuff in separate, maybe separate projects, or someone can. Uh, implement some a trading bot, let's say, for himself, uh, and use the BISC uh, API provided to to do this. Uh, the third uh, the third point in the in the uh, uh, countermeasures brainstorming was to only allow the BISC API, uh, the HTTP API, uh, to be used. Uh, in tests, so that we we actually integrate the whole stuff into BISC, but not enable for enable it for uh, the the main uh, trading uh, use cases, but only for the test use cases, and only with some hacks maybe we can enable it for for the main uh, BISC trading use case. And then has been the then there has been the the uh, the, the point that Bitcoin Core which uh, is, let's say, maybe bigger and more risky than our BISC, um, offers an RPC uh, API, and they decided to do it, uh, provide it uh, to be used at your own risk. And the question was, can we, or shall we do the same? Um, yes, how we uh, then uh, already, we have the, we have the, um, we are at the point how, how to proceed, and this is where we, uh, we started. Uh, there is a clear consensus that an HTTP API is something uh, that BISC offers eventually. Uh, we had a consensus on that. Uh, however, the priority is uh, still low, and maybe if we don't do anything, it will stay too low to actually uh, become a thing someday. Um, then we had the discussion about is the API even used? So we uh, decided maybe we can uh, get uh, an idea how the BISC infrastructure looks like uh, in terms of, of versions out there and versions used. And if we uh, if we mark the API, if, if someone uses the API to use the BISC network, um, then we can uh, derive some numbers if the API is even used. Uh, then we decided to find the remainder of the business logic that is needed uh, for uh, proper working of the, the BISC uh, GUI and the HTTP API together and move it uh, to the core so that the APIs do not have to do the checks and the business logic that is still there. Uh, there has been some cleanup, but it's uh, maybe, it's the last 20% uh, that needs 80% of time to do the, to to move the stuff so in order to in order to uh, reduce the distance between uh, between the 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 BISC repository as it is now 
and the forks that provide the HTTP API so that the distance gets smaller and at least uh, maintaining the forks and keeping the HTTP API uh, functional gets less of a, of an, uh, uh, requires less effort. Um, yes, and last but not least, we decided to use uh, the testing framework. Uh, that uh, Bernard somehow uh, did with his, with his HTTP API. But maybe if we manage to be successful in moving uh, business logic that doesn't belong into the API, but it belongs to core, we maybe use um, the same testing framework, but don't use the HTTP API, but use the core API to do actual tests. There is no true end-to-end -end testing then, of course, but uh, we can at least get some green lights if the tests uh, are successful. If they fail, we, we know there's something wrong. Well, and that is uh, basically it. Um, the results uh, we had last week. Um, so um, we have some input from uh, Chris Beams, uh, who suggested that we uh, do some, uh, we go through with the separations of concerns and create something of a Bitcoin uh, command line interface application uh, that we can use simply uh, uh, equally to the Bitcoin Core RPC client version so that not only we have a, a HTTP API, but we can uh, engage other API implementations as well. Uh, yes, and that is basically the starting point we have for now. Uh, so I'd like to maybe ask uh, it into the uh, ask you guys: Do you have any uh, ideas how we can proceed? The the interesting thing is we we did find consensus on that we want an HTTP API. We did some stuff to prepare to have an HTTP API, but we never got to the to the point where we um, at least have a, have an idea how we actually integrate a usable web API that someone can use uh, with his, let's say, mobile phone and uh, control the BISC application that is running uh, at his home. So guys, yes, Wiz, please go ahead. Uh, yes, so um, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but I've been working on another project for uh, quite some time called the Bitcoin Full Stack Project, where we essentially use a bunch of Docker containers running on a Raspberry Pi. Um, and this is based off of the BTC Pay server uh, Docker framework, where you have Bitcoin D in one container and LND in another container. And uh, as uh, I was working with some other guys on re recently, um, BISC in a Docker container. And obviously the API is gonna be a critical component of this with hopefully a mobile app at some point. But um, would, with your current API spec, would it be possible to run BISC completely headless using that BISC CLI command line utility only? And also, would it be, uh, quote unquote, safe to expose the BISC API to the public internet? I believe that question uh, is addressed to Bernard or Mike. <laughs> well, we, we need... My idea was to expose it over Tor. Uh, so first of all, you need to know the address of this hidden service, but it's not sufficient at all. Uh, well, at least this will uh, provide the security uh, when, when the data is in transmit, uh, is in transit, but uh, um, it doesn't secure uh, the access. Uh, so, so uh, I would keep this uh, token or uh, password authentication um, for for start. We could work on I don't know adding some uh, certificates certificates like GPG or any other signatures. So that, for example, well, basically the public key infrastructure. Uh, uh, and then I think that should be safe, because uh, the 
uh, communication channel is encrypted with Tor, and we have uh, some authorization, which I think should be sufficient. And yeah, the API is able to run headlessly. Does this answer so your question? Yeah, so you're planning to use um, TLS certificate authentication. Um, so would no. there be some kind of no. QR code pairing? Uh, no, I don't. I don't plan on t using TLS. Uh, um, I so because you by TLS you mean authenticating the client or the server. I don't think there is oh. like too much need to authenticate server. You know the address, your onion address of the service. So that's all you need to know. You can trust that. Right. I think the concern is more, um, okay, say I make a mobile application that connects through Tor to the hidden service, HTTP uh, API. Um, sorry if this was already covered in maybe the previous call, but um, if I want to scan a QR code uh, somehow to pair this mobile app to the, the BISC API, what would that actually be scanning? Some kind of private key or some kind of certificate that it would be? Well, first of all, who, what's your concern? Do you um, do you want to out? Do you know to make uh, the server uh, able to identify the client out to authorize the client, or the other way around? Are you afraid of some man in the middle attack as a client? And you, because like SSL certificates are meant uh, to authenticate the server, uh, so that the client is sure who what is uh, who is he talking to. I think, um, like for example, with our monitoring system, we use uh, client TLS client certificate authentication as well, right? And and I think in this case, the concern is authenticating the mobile application which is the client in this case, right? Yes, I believe we had this discussion uh, last week and we came to the conclusion that there is not much of a difference if you have a, 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 a conceptual difference, if you have HTTP client authentication or if you go with uh, client certificate authentication. Uh, the, the real issue here is to keep it um, perfect forward secrecy and also keep it from uh, having uh, the possibility of replay attacks and TLS doesn't uh, serve the doesn't provide at least not every every there are cases that TLS doesn't provide this replay protection uh, it does however have the perfect forward secrecy if you if you have the right uh, set of, of cryptographic back end Yes. Okay. So, uh, if uh, if we don't care about the um, replay attacks, uh, well, I, I don't know why we should care about replay attacks if we are over going over Tor, because this is like literally nobody can repeat this, or can they? I'm not quite sure. I haven't. Like maybe, maybe, okay, maybe malicious Tor node could send the message twice, would and that would make uh, for the replay attack, right? I, I agree with you, Bernard. Uh, if if you have if you manage to do a replay attack when uh, you have to intercept, if you have to man in the middle Tor, and you have to man in the middle Tor before you actually go into the Onion network. So if you have your mobile phone up and running, then there has to be some malware on your mobile phone uh, intercepting uh, requests before they actually go into the Tor yeah. Onion network that is basically install, installed on your mobile phone as well. So Okay, yes. so are you saying that the HTTP API would only be available over Tor and it wouldn't be secure to use it just over ClearNet? No, I don't think we should expose it over ClearNet. The only on localhost. If users want to use it from localhost, that is what I would like uh, ag agree, and probably with some additional flags. So you're intending to use the Tor hidden service as a security 
Um, but for I think a lot. Of, so I think the ideal use case um, would be if I can connect directly to my Raspberry Pi at home running BISC over the ClearNet internet so that I have very low latency connection. If I have to go through Tor for every single API request, I think that would make the user experience suffer quite a bit on the mobile application side. Mm, but there's not much data that you are actually transmitting. You don't need to do like, uh, and once you establish the connection, just establishing the connection takes time and then it goes fast. You know, it's it's not a ch chat application on or anything like that. Well, it is chat application now, but yes, I see what you. I see. <laughs> yes, it is. Your, I see your point. Um, yeah, it would be nice to have it on on the clear net, though. Exactly, and I believe that is what what we uh, discussed last time. Uh, we we did not go into the into it but uh, we have mentioned to do something like uh, bitcoin core does with its uh, rpc api um and i believe if we can if we if we uh, take this idea and then combine it with maybe the idea uh chris beams just uh, posted uh, below uh, that we have uh that we have an api let's say an rpc api or another API, whatever API you want. There is one HTTP API that is only accessible via Tor. There is a command line interface, there is RPC, there is a GUI, there is stuff like this. Then we can uh, provide for the respective use case uh, the, the, the best, let's say the best security and, and privacy uh, features. Uh, that is the use case for the HTTP API would be maybe to uh, use your mobile phone on the road and uh, control your your uh, disk that is running on your always on Raspberry Pi uh, computer at home. If you are at home, maybe you can and you want to use it uh, via your uh, mobile phone. Um, then, well, it's it's the same use case. If you want to do, uh, let's say, automated uh, trading, if you want to create a trading bot, something like this, then you maybe want to use some other API provided by BISC. But there is look, but uh, there is uh, no difference between having this uh, RPC uh, API and client, and because we can have a client for the REST API, uh, and that would be also a shell script that would be able to connect to that API. The problem is because both the RPC and REST clients would still require network connection. So it doesn't matter if you connect to a local host. In the end, you just connect to some socket. Uh, Mike, on the... yes, please. You raised um, your hand. Yes, um, yeah, it was some time ago, but I think it's still relevant. Uh, yeah, going further on Chris Beam's uh, proposal, I think. Um, so, so, so if you look at all those things like the the GUI, the the command line client HTTP client. Um, I think it's important to note the differences between them because I suppose that the that the GUI will always use the the Java integration, so it will just be built in the same jar. Um, and all the others will will probably be be outside of the the jar. I think that's probably. So I don't know if you. So if you agree with this, or if you think that we should also communicate over the, the RPC, but so, so anyway, supposing that that the GUI is so is inside the jar of to so roadside, I think it's clear that the HTTP part will never be merged inside of the jar. I I think that it's kind of clear yeah. that. It will go in that direction, uh, bec mainly because of the dependencies. Um, <clears throat> so the question is to actually to have the Java API so inside of BISC core. How will you expose that to the to the to the clients? And and there you have a few choices: uh, uh, gRPC, 
so HTTP, maybe some other possibilities. And I think we just have to decide on how how do we expose the core Java as an API. And then, uh, so after that, you have indeed all the, all the, all the clients who use that, but from a dependency point of view, <coughs> we will have to, to add at least one dependency to expose the Java API. And I think the, the discussion should go around which dependency do we include to expose the Java API and then to enable all the other clients that can use it. That's, that I, that's kind of my, my summary of uh, Chris's uh, pr proposal and the discussions of last time. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Chris, you have raised your hand. Yeah, uh, I just to respond to that a bit, what I have in mind here, or I guess where, where I've been coming from when I think about this whole endeavor um, is maybe a, a little bit different and a little bit like, well, definitely reduced in, in scope than um, some of what we've done already. And so I, we'll just try to lay it out a little bit. I, as I wrote in this little blurb that I just posted, um, I'm, I'm really thinking at every step about uh, emulating the existing, not just players in the larger Bitcoin space, like you know Bitcoin, Bitcoin D, LND, C Lightning, but the larger sort of set of Unix idioms here that are just tried and true over decades. So the idea that there's this you know application BISC that exposes uh, that can be run headlessly, right, and communicated with as a daemon uh, is a very well understood idiom. And uh, being able to do that very conveniently via the command line with a with a CLI uh, that exercises whatever API is being exposed um, is, is again just kind of like seems to me like the default thing to do. It's it's just a common a common set of idioms, right? Uh, as far as what's getting exposed, again, if we look at Bitcoin itself, right, that is a use at your own risk API. It's just JSON RPC under the hood. So they're definitely exposing an HTTP endpoint. You're connecting to it via basic auth at the end of the day and, um, uh, you know, and just posting commands with arguments, right? So this could be a, a RESTful. API, this could be JSON RPC style, it could be gRPC. Uh, but what, what I've been having in mind here, at least as a start, is this reduced scope, very conservative approach, just like Bitcoin that says, uh, hey, here's an, here's an API that you can script Bitcoin Core with, or in our case, BISC with, uh, you know, write a trading bot, uh, you know, set yourself up with alerts on new offers you're interested in. I mean, we have the mobile app for that, but you get my idea. And I'm thinking of, of code that runs on localhost to do this, just something you put together in you know, Ruby or Java or whatever you want to do to uh, interact programmatically with your BISC node, right? And so that obviously is not about like an all singing, all dancing, complete uh, HTTP API over ClearNet or Tor that like a, a fully fleshed mobile app would be able to emulate the, all the GUI functionality of, of this proper with. I don't think it excludes that possibility, but I think it can help us get off the ground by, you know, as I mentioned in that blurb, like really just implementing one or two use cases in the first release, like here's get balance. I just see how much you know funds are in your disk wallet. Here's um, and then and then maybe doing you know just a little bit more ambitious but absolutely necessary uh, kind of workflow, which might be a kind of list offers, you know that you can look and see, hey, you know what offers are out there, and based on what's out there, then I might want to place offer. And like all of the other, you know, creating, reading, updating, deleting of stuff in disk, you know, accounts and 
all of this stuff can come later, but like, let's see what we could build as the most minimal uh, API just for running on local is just to be able to script this, right? And see what the community wants and see about the feasibility of later exposing that. But just to, just to begin with, uh, do it just like Bitcoin does and say, uh, this is by default, you know, the, uh, the RPC allow IP parameter here to Bitcoin D is by default localhost 17001. You can set that to some other IP, but they're strongly communicating. This is not for the public internet. You can give it a cider, you know, so it's some range of IPs, but it's not like, you know, connect to your local uh, uh, coffee shop, unsecured Wi-Fi and, and communicate you know, completely with your BISC node or your Bitcoin node. They never intended it to be that way. And it's been possible to keep things pretty simple and pretty lightweight, I think, in, in Bitcoin's RPC API that way. So they're definitely depending on some libraries. They didn't implement HTTP themselves. They're using, I don't know, Boost or whatever, right, to, to do, you know, basic HTTP stuff. And I don't know if they're also using a JSON library. I think they are. Um, you know, there's there's compact JSON libraries out there for Java that you know under the hood depend on either Java's own HTTP API or um, you know like uh, Squares or OK HTTP. These are like minimal you know dependencies, re really reasonable dependencies. Um, but it's but it's a, a bit of a different, at least initial vision for what the API even is for, the set of use cases that it's for. And, and I guess, you know, I, I hope I'm not just totally rehashing what we talked about last time when I wasn't here, but um, to understand what I've written, I think you have to have that perspective that it's about something quite modest to begin with. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, so I have a few questions maybe. You, you, you would suggest that we, leave BISC with its GUI uh, as is and just add another uh, type of, uh, let's say, well, uh, API that one can connect yeah, to yeah. Using, using username and password and uh, just oh, give it sorry. there and say, uh, well, uh, do it, use it as you like, but don't uh, think that it's very safe. Yeah, I, I meant to address that. Thanks for asking. So. So the idea, and you know, I'm totally open to whatever counter feedback here or something like that. I mean, maybe I'm missing something, but but to me, the the default thing to do would be leave the GUI exactly as it is, uh, with maybe some necessary refactoring along the way. But leave the GUI as it is, talking to the core Java APIs, clean those up a little bit as necessary, whatever. Um, I know that's always what what Manfred intended, right? That you know, like basically why introduce an indirection from the GUI to the core Java APIs when it's all sitting there in Java and can, you know, uh, uh, perfectly fine, you know, just programmatically call the Java APIs. Um, so that, that would be the answer to that question from my perspective. And then uh, also what Mike was mentioning that, that anything, you know, HTTP wise would be uh, implemented probably outside of uh, this proper uh, what I'm suggesting is that this this most minimal, uh, you know, kind of uh, API approach would be implemented in BISC, so that it's just all there out of the box, exactly like Bitcoin and, and the rest. Uh, you know, you could just run BISC with dash dash daemon or run the BISC D uh, binary, right? And that's, you know, daemon by default. And voila, you know, you can programmatically interact with BISC, but probably from localhost or from a very specific IP address. Did that answer all your questions, Florian? Yes, it uh, did answer. Uh, thank you. Um, we discussed last time that maybe uh, uh, making the API only available to local hosts is not secure enough because, yeah, well, if you browse a website, it can maybe trick you to click on a link that says local host something. So there has to be maybe some additional uh, security in there. I'm not sure. Is, is there, is there, do you have some information yeah, the, about this? Yeah, I mean, you would still do auth, right? You'd still have like Bitcoin has the RPC using RPC password or the RPC cookie file. 
approach. So, you know, you couldn't just, I don't know, throw together, you know, like if this were JSON RPC, right, everything's a post anyway. So like links aren't going to be able to do anything since those are always get, but you know, if you threw together a form, that's going to post, you know, something very, uh, it, you know, it's going to spend all your money or whatever. Um, you'd still have to opt in to, to do that. And you you have the you believe that having username and password is is good enough for starters. If we create uh, the if we, if we if we enhance the API to do some stuff where you can spend money or uh, stuff like this, then we can talk about uh, creating more powerful authentication methods. Well, again, I'm I'm just defaulting to if it's good enough for a Bitcoin proper, it's good enough for us. Um, you know, it, 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 when everything is so couched in the caveat, this is not for the public internet, things become easier in that way, right? But, um, you know, they're, they're doing basic off. It seems to be just fine. There's no giant exploits that I've heard of for Bitcoin's uh, RPC API. Well, why not? Why not start there, right? And then see what's, See what's required and be very careful before we start actually um you know mutating stuff in, in this you know maybe it's a, i guess placing an offer is already you know changing things but but bitcoin's api you know allows you to to put together a transaction and broadcast it and you know uh sign transactions and spend your money right so it's it doesn't seem crazy to me that we would follow suit there um, so you would agree that if if we start by uh, let's say a uh, get offer something get list of offers uh, get an offer book uh, via the API via the HTTP API, uh, then you use username and password because it, you don't even need it because you only get the list of offers. Every can everyone can get the list of offers, and so we have a starting point and then we can go on from there. Sure. I mean, I, the way it works in Bitcoin is that you're you've, you're always authenticated, right? There is sort of no communicating with the API without being authenticated. Yeah. Um, they make that really easy now with this RPC cookie file thing. So basically, if it's all running on localhost, Bitcoin D, uh, generates this RPC cookie file, which is just a username and a password colon delimited in a, in a known location. And so if you're running Bitcoin CLI on the same machine, Bitcoin CLI assumes that RPC cookie file location and just reads the username and password, which are randomly generated, right? And then sends it along to the server. So it's all very, very convenient. But if you were in fact, you know, remotely accessing it via some IP, then you would have to do the username and password game. Really yeah, the, the Tor control connection we are already using is already it's also using username and password if there is no cookie mm. file available. So basically, that is what we are already using. Um, uh, maybe some other guys have some some uh, ideas or comments to this topic. Well, so basically, whatever is has been prepared in the pull request right now matches exactly the requirements. But Chris has uh, now uh, stated and suggestions. And well, the only thing missing is the uh, CLI client, but that should be very easy to implement. Well, that is great news, I, I believe. And the CLI client uh, can be done, I believe, with other programming, programming languages? Maybe there well, is some... of, yes, of course, we can do it. In, I think we should be able to do it with shell script or uh, Python or Node.js, whatever we want. Yeah. Because this is just sending, uh, you could even use curl to send requests. Exactly. So uh, maybe to sum this up, uh, there, uh, please, uh, please uh, uh, respond if there is there is something wrong with it just summing this up if we create if we, if we create uh, an api an http api that runs on localhost uh, it requires username and password uh, and we only for starters uh, 
create the functionality of uh, getting an offer book, something like this. So we have it in BISC and we can see how it is used and how we can manage it. If you decide to uh, start up, fire up a Tor, a Tor hidden service for your API, then there is basically nothing different. Um, you still have to use uh, authenticate using uh, username and password. You can use it from your mobile phone and uh, you are able to get an offer book. And that's it for starters. We don't have any security risk uh, by only creating the offer book functionality. There is no uh, risk that uh, some attacker can script uh, a create of a denial of service attack, something like this, to flood the network, something like this. We just get the offer book and that's it. Uh, is that a, a way to go? Mike, yes, please. Um, yes, well, I think that summary is indeed correct, but I think that, yeah, the big, well, yeah, there is one big thing that we have to resolve, and that's that this is one, namely, but will the maintainers merge as we into BISC a core? And uh, Bernard is saying that the HTTP API, it gives to everything that CBeams wants to have in an API, that's, that's completely correct. But it also brings with it dependencies that we've seen that the maintainers are not really happy to merge. So I think we should discuss this because that's kind of a big uh, blocker. So my feeling is that uh, Chris would prefer that maybe you do a really lightweight also HTTP JSON kind of thing inside of core. And then you can have a full blown HTTP also API which talks to that JSON, uh, JSON HTTP also API inside of core. So I think we have to be really upfront about this saying, okay, will the HTTP API dependencies be, be ever as merged into core or not? And if the decision is not, then we know that we have to choose something else to do the talking from core. And then, okay, the HTTP API will be just one of the clients, just as the CLI will be a, a client and um, so on, so on, so on. So, but I think the point that we have to discuss now, so now is which dependencies are appropriate to merge into BISC core, and and if it's not the HTTP API dependencies as they are made by Bernard, and okay, we have to to say that up front. Eh? Uh, yes, agreed. Uh, however, um, for uh, to to sum this up. Uh, do you guys all agree that we uh, start with uh, having the offer book available via an API and that's it and we use the HTTP basic authentication, so username and password for starters, so that we, we can uh, agree on this basic set of functionality and uh, for the next step we, we see how we can uh, make that happen. Uh, are you guys, uh, uh, do you guys agree with, with this functionality to make a first step to actually provide some API uh, for BISC? That seems like a very good plan, yes. Okay, so I think- Could you repeat that? I, I missed that. Um, the, the question was if, if everyone is okay with uh, having this small set of features, uh, namely uh, you create, uh, you can uh, get an alpha book via the API uh, and use username and password authentication to authenticate against your BISC installation. And that is the basic. This, that is the set of features we want for the first API to be merged in, into into BISC, and that's it. Can we agree on on this uh, feature? Uh, it, it sounds great to me. Um, I'm not sure it addresses what Mike was talking about, though, and it, which is really relevant. I mean whether to bring in these dependencies and I, you know, I, 
it's out of my mind right now exactly what those dependencies are and so on, but sort of how heavyweight or lightweight the thing is and so on um, definitely matters. And I'm, I'm hesitant to just kind of drop suggestions like this because, you know, I haven't, I haven't been participating in the work. I haven't developed I, a lot of work has gone into this stuff. I know over a long time. Um, so I don't want to be sort of uh, flippant about just saying like, you know, Hey, let's just not use that or something like that. I, I don't, I don't mean to, to be that way, but maybe it would be a path to, for that very first uh, release, right? If we think about releasing this really incrementally and just putting out that first use case of a, of a list offers, right? That maybe that is the most minimal possible implementation just from scratch. Again, using maybe some libraries, right? Like a well-known JSON RPC library that has very minimal dependencies to get it out there, to get the community interested, to get feedback on what are the use cases that people want to see, to communicate what our sort of general plan is that we don't intend to have this be an all singing, all dancing, public internet kind of API yet at least. Uh, and then, and then, you know, get that feedback, right? Actually get our hands dirty with that. And then have this conversation about, okay, should we take the existing stuff, you know, Bernard's implementation, Mike's implementation, all the dependencies, reduce the dependencies, whatever it is. I just think we might be able to defer that decision and set of changes that might come, if, come from it just by implementing that one or two use cases from scratch, basically, in the simplest way possible. Yeah, I've looked at... Uh, I've looked at my uh, very old pull request where I, um, instead of putting HTTP API, I did it only with RPC. And it's, well, the, the, inside the Gradle, the direct dependencies, there were only three. Uh, gRPC Netty Shaded, gRPC Protobuf, gRPC Stub. Uh, but uh, the witness file, grew by 17, I think, transitive dependencies. And this is similar amount to uh, to the number of dependencies for HTTP API. So uh, unless there is some other library that I don't know, but I was concerning like this gRPC uh, as being the, developed by Google. Um, unless there is any other library that would be small, uh, basically in, in number of artifacts and, repos and, and the repositories uh, that those artifacts are built from because I think that would be our main concern but it, we will have dependencies this way or an, another yeah agreed I, I'm not sure I realized that you had um, implemented those bits with gRPC so I, I, think, I think personally the very simplest thing that could be done and it follows with you know, Bitcoin and co is JSON RPC. I mean, very simple to implement, lots of implementations out there. It's gotta have some HTTP implementation underneath it, client's implementation. Um, I've done some research on that, but I'd have to spin it back up and see, see what the very simplest, lightest weight, most reliable, trustworthy sort of thing is. Um, I mean, I'm trying to defer the hard decisions in, in this, this approach in like one such decision. I, you know, I, I was the one advocating gRPC uh, a way back, right? So I'm super open to that, but I, I just, I don't know what, it's hard for me to like predict what's actually going to serve us best, right? Is it a RESTful API? Is it a gRPC API? Is it just JSON RPC, um, are, you know, because the gRPC promise is great, right? You know, just generate in any language the bindings that you want, and it's all just there, and it all just works, right? But people do have to deal with generating those bindings, right? And very often, you know, they just want to just wanna hack on some JSON. I, I don't know what people are going to be, I don't know what our audience is like here, right? So if we could defer that, a little bit 
you know, making that kind of final decision and really building everything out. Just do something super simple right now. Maybe that, you know, just gets the momentum going. Yes, I, I agree that that would be best to postpone, but unfortunately, the our main concern right now is the dependencies and they are um, they are dependent on this decision, actually, very heavily, uh, if you want to go gRPC or JSON. But this way or another, I see that the direct dependencies, yes, they are small, but transitive, they are still uh, many. And that's because uh, those really well-funded libraries are very modularized, and they use other well-known libraries to not to repeat the, the code. Uh, do we have some uh, projects that already use these libraries, like maybe Bitcoin Core? Can we have maybe? Can we? Can uh, we uh, Bitcoin Core is in written in C, so those okay. are different. Groups. Okay. Um, I I think that as well in D is using gRPC, if, if I'm not mistaken. But that's also not written in Java. But yeah, it's the same, uh, the same dependency. Uh, because what I'm thinking is, we can never be sure of of uh, any uh, library to be perfect, and there will be no perfect library. But we have to find some. Uh, we 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 need to get there if we if we trust the library or if we trust the library not. And if we do not trust the library, we can't use it. However, if we, if we don't trust any library, we don't have BISC anymore. So there, have to be, uh, there has to be some middle ground. Yeah. How can we proceed? I think we just have to find a, cons a consensus on which dependency we want to merge in core. So maybe we have to present alternatives for JSON RPC, for gRPC. And maybe something else. Uh, yeah, of course you can also build uh, just the socket, and then talk proto buffer to it, like we do with the peer-to-peer -peer network. But yeah, maybe then that that becomes uh, too much of an engineering effort again. So uh, uh, no, that will be a problem for clients because we need to ex uh, provide this API in form of uh, yeah. some common format, right? That's another issue, but yeah. There also, as Chris said, we don't know the audience. It's possible that they will consume core core API directly, or it's possible that they all go through the the, the CLI and the, the HTTP as is provided by BISC. But uh, yeah, that's to be seen. But my my point is maybe we should just list a, f a few dependency alternatives and then. And then just to ask the question to the to to the maintainers and to everyone, which of these two are acceptable or the most acceptable to add to core? Um, there has been another uh, point in last week's discussion. Uh, there has been the suggestion to create a separate app, uh, just like we have now for. Uh, for example, BISC Desktop is the, the GUI, and there is BISC Seed Node, that's the Seed Node, and there is a BISC a Price Node, and so on. These are all um, uh, binaries, their own binaries that have, been, have to be launched on their own. And if we create a BISC API, for example, uh, we can maybe uh, integrate the, the whole uh, dependency stuff into the BISC API project, the BISC API project and binary, therefore, uh, then uses the core, of course, as BISC Desktop does as well. Uh, but we have the if we if we say well the the standard installation procedure only builds BISC Desktop, then there is no such uh, maybe rogue or new library uh, in the in the the default installation. So maybe we can separate it that way that we can postpone the uh, somehow the decision to move forward basically. Yeah. Yeah. The way those the way those all work is they're just um, they're ultimately shell scripts that are generated by Gradle uh, that cobble together the class path necessary to to run things, which is the same for everyone, 
right? BISC seed node, BISC desktop. These are all, um, you know, coming from core and, and they all have the exact same class path, set of jars on the class path. The only thing that's really different between any of them is the main class that's specified. So, you know, seed node main gets invoked instead of, uh, you know, desktop main or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so the, the BISC D, uh, you know, ID here, which would be the equivalent basically of BISC API, just headless uh, BISC node, uh, it would be the same scenario. It would just be a different entry point, different main class, main method that uh, doesn't, you know, invoke the the UI code path, the JavaFX stuff, right? So I, I don't see that the class path would by default be any different there. Um, and it's not obvious to me that we would want to try to do that. I mean, we could think more about it. But I, I mean, in the end, like if you look at the dependencies that we have, you know, I introduced Spring for the rewrite of, uh, you know, of uh, the price node, right? And, you know, that brings in a whole bunch of stuff. We probably have, you know, the HTTP, well, we certainly have the HTTP libraries that, that Spring brings in with its, you know, kind of REST support and so on already on the class path. We have a lot of stuff on BISC's class, class path. And I'm not, I mean, to me, it's not the biggest concern, right? Like, it's a concern and we should, from this point forward, always be skeptical about adding new stuff, right? Uh, totally agreed about that. But, you know, what matters the most is, to me at least, is, you know, is this going to serve the need of, of users here? Is it lightweight in the sense, not necessarily of the dependencies that it adds, though that's important, but lightweight in the sense of, can people get in here and make changes and understand this and so on? If I did it again today, I probably would not introduce Spring for the price node. Uh, not because it doesn't work well, it works very well, right? But if you look all through the rest of this, you know, BISC is not an enterprise Java application. It's very different. Uh, you know, it's, it's a desktop app, it's a distributed, you know, sort of node-based thing. And when you touch all the different parts of BISC and then you come along and you touch the price node, it's a different beast, right? And, and, and as useful as Spring is and as much an advocate as I obviously am, um, you know, you want to ask, like, what are the kind of set of expectations, norms, idioms that people are following in the rest of the code base? And for me, that's the concern when I think about heavyweight and, and so on. It's like what frameworks are being introduced? how much overhead is there and just understanding how this damn thing works. And when we talk about something like JSON RPC, it's, you know, even if you know nothing about JSON RPC, you go read a one page website and you get it right. JSONRPC.org. So, you know, this is like super minimal overhead and my, you know, the idea hopefully is that we're really attracting contribution. And I think, I think people, contributing to the API, if we can set it out, if we can set out the set of patterns, right, that, you know, like, this is how you add a new command. This is, you know, the set of things that typically change when a new call is introduced or a call is changed. That's the kind of thing that's like really fun for people to come along and propose a new change and implement that call and, you know, just see the fruits of their work. And, you know, maybe we can actually spread out this effort a little bit, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking a lot here about the, the sort of usability or developability, I guess, of, of the whole thing. Um, you know, when you're, a, when you're a closed team building an enterprise app, you can make all these decisions about frameworks and, um, you know, the way things are done and just tell everybody, this is the way it is, learn it, right? Go to a training or whatever. And here we want to be like, you know, in, in, in my book, much more just kind of let's make things obvious how stuff works. And, you know, all stuff that's already widely understood and not necessarily assuming a kind of enterprise background and so on. So. Yes, but um, are you sure, Christoph, that um, uh, the seed node uh, classes are, uh, land in the jar where the desktop classes are? I could be wrong, but I'm. That's how I'm remembering it, at least. I don't think the class paths are different there. Hmm. I thought that those are like completely different jars. They 
Hmm. You're making me question myself here. They are, in fact, different jars because they're, you know, different sub-modules. Like, um, well, yeah, right. They, they're made, there are bits in seed note, at least potentially, that get put in that jar that don't get put elsewhere. That does, that does sound right. Yeah, so, so that, that yeah, would say, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, that, so that approach of having separate application, like seed note, uh, re results in the main desktop app that will be shipped to most of the users. It will yeah. not, it will not have the um, classes and the dependencies from the API. And that was the point of uh, Florian, I guess. Yeah, so g good points, right? I Thanks for the correction. And so that would be viable. That would be a viable solution if the problem, the principal problem that we're trying to solve is just not adding more dependencies. Like if we're actually comfortable with the dependencies and they're, you know, reliable libraries and stuff like that, like, and it's the, and it's the otherwise the right solution. Like it, you know, satisfies users needs, which we don't necessarily know what they are yet. And it, and it, for me, one requirement is this kind of, you know, friendly developability, right? Uh, if it checks all those boxes, then, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, you know, say absolutely not because it has 17 megabytes of dependencies necessarily, right? So, I, so I'm not sure that, like, yes, that could be a solution. Let's, you know, factor off this separate binary, with, you know, different cross path that includes the, API stuff that we don't want anywhere else. Totally agree that's possible, but um, I'm just not sure that that's the, the most important problem or the only problem to solve. I, I just want people to be able to get into this API and have it be obvious how stuff works and clean. And, 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 and look, I'm not, I'm not familiar with what you've built. I, I, I just don't know. I'm just sort of stating the requirements as I see them. I just check the libraries and at least IntelliJ says it that's the same. Uh, there there are spring uh, framework libraries in desktop. So um, maybe we have to check it in more detail. Yeah, but I think that spring the bit of uh, spring that are inside of the uh, desktop it's are less. for yeah. the properties. That's right. Mm -hmm. There's spring cores there just to get the environment uh, API. And and ah, what's okay. in price node should should be more must include at least Spring Web, um, which you know brings in other stuff. Well, then I would suggest we we add to the to the how to how to uh, proceed uh, list to check if we can create a sub project with KPI that only in this sub project if this sub project is used and built. The, the uh, dependencies are there and not, not nowhere else. Uh, at least if we know that this is possible, it would be a way to go because right now it seems that the biggest question, the biggest uh, 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 gateway, uh, locked gate in this case, is to get the, the dependencies into the core uh, BISC repository. And everyone is saying, no, well, no, no more dependencies. and and if we can uh, capsule it in the API project, if this is possible, then we at least have this uh, door opened, more or less, to, to be able to move forward. Yes, that would be something very satisfactory to me. OK, so I add this to the list uh, of things we, we can check. And then there is the, the second question I have. Uh, you, you said there is already spring on the class path can we use can we use it so we we can create the same functionality we we want it's very small subset in the um, in the desktop uh, it's a it's actually in dependency of core so it's a very small subset of spring and definitely not enough to create an api okay. api okay. stuff is well the web framework so something that api could be built on top of is in the Price node, I think. Okay. Well, uh, then the, the second follow-up, uh, the third follow-up question I have is, uh, uh, Chris mentioned 
that uh, it 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 would be nice it, it, that is it is easy for uh, new developers to add a new uh, API to add to the API functionality. Uh, but now, do you think that is uh, an overly complicated thing to create new uh, features for the API? No, absolutely. It's just a matter of uh, creating one class with the, with a method or use existing class if it corresponds to any of those resources. Like for example, we could have a, a, a resource with to list the offer book, so it will be uh, slash offers, uh, and you want to add a new endpoint post offers. Yeah, so post slash offers, then you would just put another method into the same class that the get uh, offers is, and that's it. And for uh, for a data model, you just create one class that would cor correspond to the uh, request payload, put some annotations on it. Even you don't have to put annotations if you don't want to, but if you would like to have some validation and stuff like that. You could you could add additional yeah, annotations and and that's it and the rest is just to invoke the core Java uh, methods like for example on offer manager or uh, I know user manager any of those core classes because API doesn't and shouldn't do anything apart from just translating the input. Sending, invoking some method in core, and then translating the result of that uh, call, be it an exception or the returned value, and just translate it to the JSON or relevant status code, and that's it. Yeah, sounds great. So the only thing that uh, that there would be uh, difficult for newcomers is if if the BISC core API doesn't let it uh, let do the the, the stuff the the news already does, but that is. Uh, that is for your HTTP API the same as it would be for any other API. Yes, yes, I think so. Yeah, G in gRPC it's exactly the same. You have to create a method and uh, just make a call to it's the, 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 just the translation between the R uh, RPC and the uh, and the JSON. That's that's a different thing. But that's really just internal to, the, to this REST or RPC layer. Okay. Well, that actually sounds nice. So to, to give, us, give us more a summary uh, where we are now, uh, we agreed on uh, having an API that for starters, having an API that just only just uh, serves the, an offer book, so we can foreclose any uh, coded attacks because it's only get offers and that's it. Um, we use we want to use uh, username and password authentication, basically HTTP basic authentication, uh, for now, uh, where. Uh, because it's it's used by by Bitcoin Core as well, um, we use uh, it's good enough for Bitcoin Core as well. Uh, we state clearly that uh, the API is not for the big wide world. It's only for uh, your convenience if you want to use it at your own risk um, to get started. If we manage to create a sub project, let's say BISC dash API. That handles all the uh, that concludes uh, uh, has all the dependencies, uh, and and none of the, the API dependencies spill into BISC Desktop, for example, or even Core. Uh, then we have this API uh, encapsulated into the in in the BISC API project. So, for starters, we can offer a BISC API build uh, that features the get offers and has no other impact on the BISC application itself. So that is basically, as I understand, we are now in the discussion. 
Um, well, that is, I believe, a real, uh, that is a nice conclusion. Yeah, I agree. So I don't know if a squirm is a, is a listening, but so maybe he can also share his uh, perspective or because he's one of the guys who will have to emerge it. So maybe that's also important. Yeah, I believe SQ is, is uh, because of privacy reason. Oh, he says it. <laughs> if it's if it's the community opinion, he says he will just merge it in the in the chat. Well, that is that. And if and if we can be sure that the class part doesn't spill over, I think there's not much to be. I had, there isn't so a lot against it. The only thing you two can say is okay if. If people change core, then they, then they will also have to change the API, probably. That's the only downside, I think, to merging it. Down and uh, positive, both. Yeah. Depends yeah. how you see it. But because we will have, uh, it will help people to keep the core stateless. Some, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, well, so I think right after the merging of the API, I think the the core Java API will need to see some love. Yeah? Definitely, but for start, I think we will uh, we will we won't have to change much. I think we probably yeah, ju just a little bit of the startup um, uh, files, uh, but that's something that Manfred has uh, written. So that's safe. Um, SQ says so, in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, Chris, go on. Uh, go ahead with that, I can follow up after. Okay, um, uh, SQ just posted in the chat that he does not like to include the uh, uh, dependencies in core, uh, but, uh, would, but uh, that would be uh, resolved with having an own API project or sub sub build basically um, but he says any risky dependency that becomes popular in an in the api project for example will if if the api is widely used and uh, it will still endanger bisc um, i believe uh, e e yes to an extent if we just keep the feature on the on the offer book right now uh, that wouldn't be that much of an impact. Uh, yet, of course, if we if we add the add offer or a, a take offer functionality, that will be different. But maybe that is a bridge we we cross if we get there. I don't know. Um, okay, from a usability perspective and from a doing what's well known and obvious to people perspective. Um, so think about Bitcoin Core again. If you're running Bitcoin Core, Bitcoin QT, like the, the UI, right, the app that you double click on, uh, you can parameterize that with dash server, right, at the command line or, or in your bitcoin.com file, and that'll light up Bitcoin's RPC API, which is definitely a use case that makes sense. Like, you may want to interact with the GUI talking to the same underlying data directory that the RPC API communicates with, right? All in one thing. You might be basically a user of both interfaces at the same time. So you want to be able to enable the RPC API from the GUI, but if this is just a you know headless Raspberry Pi running somewhere or some cloud instance, you don't want or need uh, a UI at all, and you just want to be able to SSH in and you know run Bitcoin D or run it as a as a service or whatever, and you want it to be totally headless and just write a log file and be able to communicate with its RPC API. So when when Bitcoin D is run, you know it's really just the exact same thing as running Bitcoin Core, but shuts off the UI, 
and implicitly enables the dash server option. And I think we would want to do the same thing here. Like it's all in one. So you can, you can interact with your BISC node however you want, as a GUI, as a headless daemon, or both, basically. Um, and if there's a separate app that, that, that people have to run that's not just basically this kind of aliased, you know, Bitcoin D convenience utility, but like actually a separate app, now you're running into the question, okay, well, can I run my BISC UI and this API at the same time, talking to the same data directory, you know, you'd have to explain whether that's possible or not and why. And, and, and it's sort of just out of the norm of what you would usually do in, in a situation like this. So this all kind of, very sorry for the noise of construction here, um, but this all kind of adds up for me to making the argument that we should integrate this at a pretty core level, right? There's, there is no more basic way of interacting with Bitcoin Core than talking to Bitcoin D, right? That is a less complicated thing than running the UI. If you just think about like the number of cycles involved in threads and blah, 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 right? Needing a display or whatever. Um, same thing with BISC, that the most rudimentary, most fundamental way to interact with it would be run it as a daemon, and talk to it uh, programmatically. So that is kind of a case for putting stuff in core, right? And I think that's where we get back to like, okay, is what we're introducing there, if we merge it into core, is it a reasonable thing to do? Is it, you know, giant and heavyweight and complicated and, you know, thousands of lines of code or something like that? Or is it, you know, this lean, mean, simple, fit to purpose kind of scenario? And and I think we can just evaluate that, right? Um, but, but, I, but I am basically making a case for, for integrating it at the lower level. Agreed, Chris. It's just that we are very afraid, at Manfred and some other developers are afraid that about the risks. But on the other hand, we want to get this thing going because there was a lot of effort. So this is like a temporary measure I'd say to have it as a separate project, just to see mm -hmm. if people would like to use it. Uh, mm -hmm. And for, mostly for people who want to just see the API and uh, maybe write a script for that. And later on, I agree with you, it would be awesome if I could uh, start uh, integrated into core and just with parameters or even with clicking in the GUI, if I want to enable the API or disable it um and be able to access my, uh, this um, the same data st uh, that i have uh, that i see in the uh, ui and through the api and probably on my mobile but that would be like the ultimate uh goal but uh, once we decide that uh libraries are fine we are okay with the dependencies maybe we would like to change the dependencies uh on the way but just to get the thing into the official bisc project, uh, I think that's a really good idea that Florian proposed, to have it as just like a seed node, a separate application that people intentionally have to start, and we don't introduce new risks for people that, are, that don't want the API and they just want to use the desktop. Sure, I'd be fine with that to, to get the ball rolling now. Can we, can we somehow uh, configure uh, uh, just a shot in the dark here. Uh, tell Gradle some somehow that we want a build that includes the API, or if we want a build that does not include the API in the BISC desktop, for example. Is there is there such a thing? Can we do this? Uh, that includes like it, it, the API as a sub project, like assuming it's modeled as a sub project. I don't know, for example, yes. Hmm. Um, if, it's, if it's modeled as a sub-project like all the others we've been talking about, seed node and so on, uh, that's, that's going to produce its own, its own binary, its own jar file. Um, and having de desktop kind of conditionally include that i'm i'm not so sure I, 
I'm not, I'm not sure that what you want is really feasible, but I need can to think we, about it more, can, we, can we include the BISC desktop binary basically in the BISC API app or a sub-project? Mm -hmm. I see. So it's a superset of everything, but 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 it can be invoked in a way that the desktop doesn't come up, right? Uh, I guess I would best emulate what we're actually going for, right? So so the usage the, the, the usage model would be what we actually want. We're saying like, if you want to try out the API, then you need to run disk in a different way. You need to run disk via this path, via this jar, via this little script that invokes it. BISC-D, BISC-API, whatever. And here's a set of switches. You actually can light up the UI. It's a total superset of it. Um, or you can run it headlessly, right? Um, yeah, but the idea is not to get the uh, API into the official binaries that we should yeah, yeah. post anywhere yeah. in the GitHub and advertise. Yeah, but I think if I understand what you're asking for, and you're just asking, like, can we produce a, a, a binary, this kind of alternative, hey, we're just testing this stuff out, getting feedback stage binary, that is the entirety of BISC plus the API. I exactly. don't think so because the main class uh, needs to start the API anyway. Uh, so so there, there is code, uh, we don't have modular approach. I wanted to do that, but Manfred did not agree on this, depending on the mm -hmm. jars that we got. Uh, so inside your BISC app or one of those main classes, uh, there is a code that needs to see if uh, on the uh, on the command line there was a parameter to start the API, and if so, then uh, instantiate the class and and start it. Yeah, but to yeah. do this, you actually need the dependencies in the, the binary code. already. Yes, yes, uh, unfortunately. And uh, the, yeah, the idea we, I, I proposed... This, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, the idea I proposed uh, is, is basically you, you, you start... If you, you have two binaries, there is BISC desktop that is same old, same old, and no risk, no API. And then there is the BISC API. If you want to use the API with BISC, it's an experimental feature, it's a new feature, I don't know. If you want to use it, you have to build uh, BISC in a way that the BISC API binary is uh, let's say built and then in the uh, BISC API project you also already uh, you, you also uh, start up the BISC desktop app so it, it, it looks like BISC but has the API but you have to uh, uh, do uh, build the whole application some somehow different so then we have the separations of concerns there is in the BISC API is the are the dependencies that are uh, maybe risky or not I don't know um, and we have the convenience that you start up your BISC desktop, BISC API. I don't know how it is, how the binary is called. And then you can uh, do the dash server or dash API or something like this and have it all in, in one and uh, use the same data directory and use the same everything. And you just have the API, the API uh, additionally to the, to the desktop application, but only if you build it that way. That is basically the idea. Mm, I think that you could have some additional source directory that could be, con mm, well, not sure con if conditionally, but you could create like different project. No, actually I'm using this, but I've got this integration test task in Gradle. And for that task, uh, it uses uh, classes from completely different directory. It's not using from the test directory, but from integration tests. Uh, so probably we could have like a different command uh, for building that would mod mm, use ad additional source files that, and there would there would be this class that would actually additionally start the API and that class would not be included in the uh, the main bundle uh, that is officially released. Something like this, yeah, maybe it's just an idea. So, so I propose the the simplest thing it could possibly work, um, even though it'd be ugly, right? Let's say we create this this sub module, uh, this API. We 
copy the the main method, the main class logic from this desktop, right? Just imagine literally copying and pasting that class, calling it something else, and then changing one line that it looks for and invokes this API if if so instructed, right? So basically, there's some programmatic set of bits that need to invoke, you know, spin up the desktop aspect of this, and there needs to be a hook to spin up the, the server, the API, right? Exactly. So why not just do this in the sub project so that there's this total superset of everything? Again, just to get the ball rolling, we can make this much better. But, I, but I, I'm, I'm not seeing that we'd have to do any sort of, you know, source directory hacks or, or anything like that. It's just... Yeah, just replicate the behavior from desktop and then add the API switch. Exactly. I, I don't I don't see the the, the BISC desktop uh, main class, but I have the seed node main class here. And if you take take something like the seed main class and uh, uh, something like the seed node main class, and you start a BISC desktop app and the API, and that's it, and that's the the entry point for the application, then you are good. And it's one class more, maybe. Maybe it's it's not even one uh, one additional class because the API has to have its main class already. And if you if we can somehow fire up the the, the BISC desktop inside this class, that would be maybe a clean solution. Yeah, I think that it would be doable. Uh, do you guys agree that we uh, take this on on the on the list uh, to check if this is possible and if it is possible that we go forward with this approach? I agree. Yeah, with the idea that this is what we're doing to get a ball rolling to get this in front of early adopters, users to validate our own assumptions. To, take a closer look at the implementation and the dependencies and so on. And then we make another decision down the road, like, okay, what's the actual sort of go to production real deal version of this, right? Maybe a sub project or maybe not, right? If that's kind of our approach, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in as well. This whole um, approach of uh, hacking this, um, like you said, a superset of functionality into this new app that's uh, optionally including the HTTP API seems like um, a, like a really big waste of uh, like details. I mean, I, I'm I mean I'm with the rest of the guys. Jar dependencies are scary and bad, and we should avoid them whenever possible. But I think adding an HTTP API, uh, you know, like you said, if it was one of those uh, dependencies like from Square. Obviously, many, many people are using the Square HTTP library for many financial applications and they trust it and it's community validated. So I think in this specific case, adding a jar depth would be reasonable. Um, but I do understand like, you know, jar depths are scary. So maybe we should actually just have a, a, a call with the, the most uh, skeptical people who are against the jar depths and kind of break down the reasons why they're against adding it. Maybe we could even consider a few various uh, jar depths and get some consensus on which ones exactly we should add instead of, you know, going through this whole um, Rube Goldberg machine to basically implement a version of the API that we're not going to want to end up using in the long run anyway. I, I mean, from, from my uh, specific use case where I want to put a Raspberry Pi in the homes of many people and have a very slick mobile app on their phone where they can trade with BISC anywhere, um, you know, this temporary API really doesn't uh, do much for me. So I'd really like to see the full-blown API just implemented as soon as possible with the, a very high quality jar dependency added if necessary. But I mean, this is, this is one of those times where like it's totally necessary uh, or reasonable to add a jar dependencies. Just, of course, we have to be very careful in which one we select and, you know, look at all the security, uh, you know, potential uh, risks and everything. But 
I mean, is it mostly Manfred who's against this uh, adding the jarred up? Maybe we can, you know, present it with a few options and. and yes. Yes, it's basically yeah. Manfred's greatest concern. Yeah, I I can. This is, pr this is almost certainly an incomplete uh, historical view, right? Both because of just bad memory and like I only had a certain perspective on it. But I think a big piece of this was at, as these efforts were coming together with you know Mike and Bernard, your work. I think at some point we saw pull requests coming in they were just overwhelmingly large, right? Not just from a dependency point of view, but like there's just a lot of code. And forgive me because I didn't review these in depth and I was busy with other things. And I'm just sort of remembering the overall gist of something, the overall feeling of something was like, ah, too much. Yeah. And, and it was just a, like, a, like a kind of gut reaction, like please don't put all this stuff in core, right? So if we're coming at this, paring it down to a single use case, right? That's not going to be a lot of lines of code added or shouldn't be. And then there's going to be whatever set of dependencies that approach, that implementation introduces. And if we look at those dependencies and we say, God, this is really heavy or uncomfortable or complicated for whatever reason, if there's consensus about that, then we say, how can we implement that? one use case with something much simpler. And of course we have to kind of think ahead and go like, is that simpler approach going to be able to meet the needs of a broader API? Once it's kind of fleshed out, we do need to think ahead, right? But I, I mean, I must say, I agree. Like I, I don't want to jump through hoops because of some sort of like amorphous fear about just dependencies are bad, right? But rather like, I, I, I'm just so sheepish about this because there's been so much work and the last thing I want to do is just sort of like show up and go like, hey, just do it again, issue these pull requests again, whatever. And I guess I'm not saying that. I'm saying like, let's cut down to that single use case, make it as clean as we possibly can and evaluate it, right? I mean, Bernard, for you, would this be an extraordinary effort or like way time consuming for you to to put together a pull request that modifies the core main class to light up the switch for the API server or not, and to include in that pull request just one use case? Well, I, um, honestly, the, you, uh, it doesn't matter how many use cases there are that much, actually, because even the simplest, the, it's the foundation that takes the most uh, code, uh, actually. So, uh, yes, so the, the, basic, the basic stuff uh, to get the HTTP server started. And uh, in this, the most recent uh, pull request, yeah, that one, 3001, uh, look at the commits. No, just, yeah, if you look at the files, there's 58 files, but there is uh, Docker ignore, Docker images, Stuff like that. Look at the commits. Uh, look at the commits tab. Uh, but please scroll up, scroll up. Uh, and there is a commits tab um, because this is a conversation. Uh, Florian, would you scroll up? Up there. Up, 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 completely. And now next to the conversation tab, you've got commits tab. Oh, 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 now I. Yeah. Am. So, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So, so the. So the first one is minimal HTTP API. And if you click on that one, that is API still 58 space, yes. files. So it does, yeah. and it has only one endpoint, just one endpoint to get the, uh, the version of the uh, BISC that is running. But it includes <clears throat> integration tests, in, integra uh, includes some, um, Archean extensions, uh, yeah, and just a little bit modification in the core. So this to add the flags, yeah. But it is like a lot of files that you have to modify. So so the even the minimal minimal stuff it takes a lot of files, and subsequent pull requests will be very small. 
that will, for example, add this functionality to list uh, offer book. That would be four files. Okay, I have a quick question. Um, is it really necessary to include uh, Docker in this uh, API pull request? Uh, if we want to remove integration tests, then it would be okay to remove Docker because Docker is required for the, and uh, yeah, it is required for making the, um, for building the images. That are using I think purely really for the purposes of uh, reviewing the PR, it would probably be better to move um, Docker stuff into a separate PR. Okay. Well, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure about that. Uh, Docker <laughs> is there. I talked with uh, Bernard and, on, in private about this. Docker is there to provide the, the integration tests. And he has done a mighty test. So it's, it, it's really end to end testing of, of the whole BISC network, including Alice, Bob, and our trader, uh, the Bitcoin core node, uh, a seed node, everything is there. Um, the, the, the question is maybe, uh, do we want this kind of tests in such an early state? Because we only get the, the, the offer, the, the get offer, for example, we agreed on to only have the get offer. Uh, right, so I think if you want to add these uh, Docker integration tests, why don't you do a separate PR to add those? And then we can talk about that in that PR. And then for this minimal API, we can just talk about the minimal API in this PR. Right, introduce, introduce the integration tests, the first integration test when we implement the first use case that actually needs it, right? I mean, you could make the argument that you need an integration test and just get a list of offers, but, but just to do one thing at a time, right? I mean, we're going to exercise it through the CLI if we do that. You know, it's not like there's sort of no code executing that. But to see Archelian come in in a separate pull request with just one integration test and so on would go a long way to like educating everybody about how that works and what the advantages are and stuff like that. Sure, I'm okay yeah. with splitting up this pull request into several small ones. So yeah, and again, it's we, just purely to make it uh, easier for the uh, maintainers to review the individual things. Because, so like Chris said, it's very scary to see uh, just a huge, huge uh, pull request come in. Like your gut doesn't even want to look at it. Uh, and and you know, maybe it's there's some emotional things in there. But I'll give you just a quick example. The other day, um, I wanted to remove three of the hard coded uh, BTC nodes from BISC. These are only one line changes each, but. I intentionally put them into three separate PRs because I knew there would be some discussions for each one of those removing uh, the BTC nodes. And sure enough, only two of them were merged. So, you know, that's that's like a very uh, good example of why you want to separate things as much as possible just to keep the discussions as separate as possible and the reviews. Because uh, if there's any any problems, any discussions, it'll, it'll block the entire PR from being merged. Whereas you could have gotten some of it merged, right? And then the kind of baby steps would lead to getting the other stuff merged eventually. Yeah, but there, there is a flip side to this. Uh, recently, there has been uh, a, a, a quite a big pull request only on the refactoring. And uh, it was decided that uh, it has to be split up. And now we have three or four pull requests that for for each uh, uh, each pull request for itself doesn't mean nothing. It just adds code, uh, renames stuff, uh, but does doesn't remove stuff. So uh, it's 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 kind of a it does always be a middle ground on what is included in a pull request and what is not. And I am actually quite. Uh, quite happy to review such a pull request because I know well there is an API. It's a big big thing. And I uh, I commented here that if if we do not need Docker, then please remove it and exclude it and do it in a similar in another pull request. But uh, the situation has been that uh, the integration tests use the Docker containers. And so we needed to have the integration tests. The, the question now is do we want integration tests for the API? And uh, I agree with you guys that we can maybe remove for the initial uh, for the initial uh, thing of of uh, adding uh, the API, getting the API up and running. That we remove the tests because uh, if we if we do something wrong in the API part of the get offer uh, use case we agreed on uh, before, uh, there probably isn't 
there is no need to to test this as extensive as as, as it is proposed in this pull request. Um, so I would agree to to split it to just add the functionality and maybe if we add some uh, features to the API that need integration testing, that we can actually do the integration testing then and that not now. So we have a smaller pull request. And just one last thing uh, when it comes to splitting the pull request. I know a lot of the jar dependencies are related to the Docker stuff. And I, and I do understand that they're just uh, dev uh, dependencies. They're not actually shipped with the uh, final build. But I think it would be a lot less scary to um, maybe Manfred or the other guys who are opposed to just any new jar dependencies in general if uh, those were part of a separate PR. So we could get the API merged first, and then we could kind of debate on the... Uh, the reg test, the uh, Docker test uh, framework later on. Okay, yeah, I'm fine with that. So, Florian, what's your take? Um, sorry? What's your take, Florian? I thought you agreed that for Eugenial, first merge, first review, just re do it without tests. Yes, I agree, because I agree. We can do it like this, so we there is yeah less maybe less files changed or added, so yeah and 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 there is no need to maybe there is with the current uh status of of the testing status the test coverage of BISC, there is no need to test uh, a get offer uh API request feature. Okay. Okay, so sounds like we've got some consensus to proceed. Yes, and uh is there is are there any other comments? Because uh we are quite uh the time is up, one and a half hours is gone. We have some results, we have good results, I believe. Is there any other are there any other uh, comments on, on on the topic of the API? Uh, I would just offer at least potentially um, that as that first PR comes in and we actually have, uh, you know, some API surface area, that I'd be happy to put together the um, the CLI, which I would actually write in Java. But um, but just to exercise that and demonstrate my my perspective on it. I think I can have time to do this. When we get there, I could be more certain about it, but just just to offer, I could contribute that. Awesome, thank you, Chris. Yeah, good work, guys. I, I'm really uh, like to see the, uh, the full API get merged instead of that uh, temporary halfway one. Yes, baby steps. At least we get the baby steps done. Okay, so if there are no other questions or uh, comments, I'd like to close this uh, dev call. Uh, I will, as always, the, the recording will be available in a couple of hours, maybe days, uh, on YouTube, and the link is uh, posted on the end of this call uh, issue. Uh, I will uh, create some meeting minutes with the, the list of uh, how to proceed completed, and I believe we can uh, have this as a as a great result of two dev calls and a total time of uh, probably four hours of discussion. And well, thank you guys for joining. Thanks for the for the discussion. Thanks for your contributions. Um, See you next time. Thank you. See you again. Bye-bye. Great stuff. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye.